Lecture thirty seven. Now, if you will、uh, turn to page thirteen of your Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> if you have it handy, I want to just mention a few more things in passing. Excuse me, page twelve. When Joseph Smith had finished Third Nephi, he was so impressed by this treasure of information that helps a person understand the New Testament. That even though he was only 22 and a half years old, he resolved that someday he hoped it could be included with the other four gospels, and he was、um, he concentrated on the inspired version of the four gospels in order to have it printed with this part of the Book of Mormon, but was killed before he could finish the work, so it never was published. But you'll notice that we don't very often quote this in our talks. Uh, if you'll notice,、uh, just think back on sacrament meetings. In fact, it's amazing how little we quote in our talks.、Um, how long since you've heard the life of Jeremiah in a Sunday night talk, or the life of Daniel, or the life of Noah, or the life of the prophet Joseph Smith wrapped up? If you're ever、uh, assigned to speak in the meeting, and you say, "Now, what can I speak about?" Tell about the great people and their teachings that are in the scriptures that other people aren't talking about, and you'll you'll get a wonderful reaction. The Spirit of the Lord is so anxious to help you prepare it and help the audience appreciate it that people will come up to you afterwards and say, "You know, I don't think I ever heard that before in my whole life."、Uh, that's that really is、uh, important information. Kind of keep that in mind, will you? Because we need a lot a lot of sharing of this. Why, why is there a dearth of this kind of talk? It's very、uh, simple. People don't know about it, so they don't talk about it. Right? Wouldn't you agree? So when you get a chance to talk, will you tell the things that you're learning out of the Book of Mormon and get people used to hearing it? Okay. Now here's a nugget. It's not in the Bible. It's in the Book of Mormon. It is not clear why Jesus said in the New Testament to the Jews, "Take no thought of the morrow." The whole gospel plan is to lay up in store,、uh, provide against the、um, the future, be a frugal custodian and steward. That's the whole spirit of the gospel. And what's the Lord talking about? Take no thought of the morrow. When all the the whole gospel teaching has always been to take thought of the morrow and the future. What's the answer to this one? Let's let's have someone else now. In other words, there'd be an overemphasis. Yeah, now that's the answer. The real answer is this is God's instruction to the quorum of the twelve apostles and those who are called on full-time missionary assignments. They are not to take any thought of the morrow because that will be worked out and the Lord will bless them. And if you've ever taught without purse or script. I want to tell you that's when you find out whether or not you really trust your heavenly Father, and He may just test your faith a little bit and let you get real hungry before He opens the door to you. But anyway, that's what it's all about, and only the Book of Mormon makes it clear that when He says, "Take no thought of the morrow,"、uh, consider the lilies of the field how they grow, consider the fowls of the air; they all get taken care of. He's talking about those who are full-time missionaries, and and、uh, particularly the quorum of the twelve. And you notice how much of the time he turns back and forth. He'll talk to the multitude, then he'll explain things to the disciples. You notice that? Well, this is one of the times. And so, if I ask you that in your test, I would want you to be sure that you noticed it. Now, he says, "Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness." And of course, that applies to everybody. And、uh, he says, "Then all these other things are added unto you." But there's a very special instruction there to the quorum of the twelve to concentrate on spiritual things and the work of the kingdom. Now, the quorum of the twelve, you'll notice, only involve themselves in material things where it involves the interests of the church. They serve on the boards of directors of corporations that are taking care of the tithes of the widows and the orphans and the members of the church. And they will do that to make sure that that's being taken care of. President Lee is now pulling them away from that even. And pushing that onto the presiding bishopric, where it ultimately belongs, and you'll notice the quorum of the twelve are being pulled out more and more, just into the essential work of the kingdom. All right, then he turns back to the multitude and says, "Judge not." 
Now this word judge means something very technical and special. And when I ask you in your examination what judge means, uh, it says judge not lest you be judged. Well, in the ordinary sense, you judge every day. You say, that man cheated me twice. I'll never do business with him again. Right? You'd be stupid if you went back and asked and let him cheat you again. Right? Okay, now are you judging him? In a, in a general sense, you are. Then what's Jesus talking about where he says, judge not? The word would be better if it were translated some other way. And so I want you to be sure that you understand that because this appears in the scriptures. Any of you, any suggestion on what it might mean? Yeah, yeah that's right on. Who said? It would mean that Well, even... Um, right. Uh, means a little bit more than that. It's actually a technical um, term. And so uh, we got it just a moment ago. Someone suggested it. It means uh, don't sit like a judge and say, all right, you are guilty. You are forever cast off. You can never repent. Uh, never at any time again will I make any allowance for any association with you. You are cast off and in prison as far as I'm concerned. That's, that's the kind of judgment it's talking about. Uh, to say that this is a hopeless case, he's condemned forever, he's judged and abandoned um, and condemned. He's permanently condemned forever in your mind. Now that's, uh, that's what that word in its original Hebrew means. And you're going to have to forgive over and over again. Uh, don't ever cast off anyone permanently. Don't ever write anyone off completely. You'll find Jesus uh, making some of his finest workmen out of young Almas, you see, or Alma the Elder. So don't, his father didn't cast him off forever. He could have, but he didn't. Now that's what that means. Uh, that's the, the, the basic meaning of it. Now he says, um, there are those that go around preaching and condemning other people, and they have a lot more to repent of themselves. This is the business of the moat and the beam. It's so quick to criticize other people, and you have to be discriminating. You have to be, uh, uh, you wouldn't be calling anybody to repentance if you weren't aware that there are some problems in the world. But cleanse yourself. This is what he's saying. Uh, remove the um, beam from your own eye before you go out looking for moats uh, elsewhere in other people's eyes. And I'm sure no problem on that one. And then um, it says, cast not your pearls before swine. What do you think that means? Who's a swine? I mean, what's he talking about? Cast not your pearls before swine. I've seen some more. You, you all have some ideas. Let's hear some. There are two people who must not be taught the real strong principles of the gospel. One is the unworthy and the other is the unprepared. In one place, the Lord says, now don't teach this, this is the doctrine and covenants in modern times. Don't teach these precepts to men lest they perish. This will be way too much for Christianity at this stage of their immaturity. Preach repentance and the restoration of the gospel. Don't preach these tenets or they will perish, meaning they would turn on the gospel and um, find it uh, unbelievable that such doctrines are too strong. All right, then there's also the unworthy, casting pearls. I used to have a professor in law school, and the class would always get a little restless at the beginning of the term, five minutes before the hour. Well, that represented about 5% of our entire uh, period and, uh, or more. And uh, he was a member, of the, he was a justice of the Supreme Court. I mean, we, we really were getting it right from a fine authority. And he very often would have a real good little special thing we ought to know for our law exams. And, and so he'd say, now, class, are you listening? I'm about to cast a pearl. <laughs> and <laughs> only a few knew enough about the Bible to know that he was insulting us, really. <laughs> and he was calling us unworthy to receive it. We were. Our minds weren't on school. We were anxious to get out. I was working about 14 hours a day in the FBI. I was restless, I had some church work to do and so forth, and that taught me a little bit of the discipline of maintaining the academic atmosphere. Otherwise, a teacher will stop teaching. And uh, so it was kind of interesting. He said, class, are you listening? I'm about to cast a pearl. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> so he, he, he would, and, and we did. Uh, in any event, uh, uh, there are times when you should not teach, uh, because just simply because the people aren't prepared for it. They're not swine. They're not unworthy at all. They're unprepared. That's a different situation entirely. Now, we have a, a, a problem we always do in our meetings about those that are unworthy of the meeting. And right when the Spirit of the Lord is just the finest and we're ready for our closing prayer to ask God's benediction, you have four or five impolite, immature, imprudent, unworthy people panic and, and say, excuse me, excuse me, I've got to get out, got to get out. They'll spoil a picture show. They'll spoil a, the hi highlight of a drama. They will uh, spoil the spirit of a meeting by trying to leave just before the benediction. Now, once in a while, you'll have a very unusual situation where a person has to leave early. And sometimes my students will come up and say, I'm, I'm going to be in the devotional chorus or something, and I'll, excuse me, if, can I be just leave a little bit early? And I, I appreciate that. But I know a lot of people are just immature human beings and childlike, they want to get out there and get in their car before the traffic starts. Where I notice cripples and aged people who are really entitled to uh, have a reason for leaving early, if anybody does, waiting until everybody's gone, and then quietly moving on out. So I always look at people who, um, and maybe we, maybe uh, maybe one would be. Uh, considered to be judging on that occasion, but in any event, people who will spoil the spirit for a whole audience by rushing up and trying to get out just before the benediction. Or that's all. Show's over. I guess I got it all. Let's go. And uh, let's see. Uh, I saw a picture show just the other night where a third of the audience left uh, and about 15% of the show is still to go on. Let's see, what was that one? It was a good one, too, something I've seen the last few, mo few months. Anyway, I kind of smiled to myself because they thought, well, we've had it. We saw it. And they didn't even know how the show came out. They all went home. It, it came to a lull, and, and uh, then the, it picked up for, it was a, an anticlimax, really. They took off. They missed it. Now, the once in a while, um, the spirit will leave a class like this. Um, maybe the teacher gets a little dull and bored, I don't know what, but the spirit leaves, and I can always tell when the spirit leaves. And I have to stop. If I can't recover that spirit, I close the class. And um, I almost did that here about three weeks ago to one class, but I didn't because I had a few students down there who were intent, but the spirit had been offended. It was gone, and I kind of slugged it out the last 20 minutes, but it was almost useless. Uh, their mind wasn't on the subject matter, they were restless, it was a nice spring day, so forth. So, um, uh, when that happens to you, uh, kind of remember, we're growing up now, we're learning how to get the spirit and hold it. Have you ever heard about missionary meetings in which they have testimony meetings for seven hours? Have you ever heard of one of those? There are such. And, and they're never intended to be seven hours, they're usually for two hours, they're scheduled for two hours. You know why they go on for seven? Missionaries don't want to let go. It's exciting. You get there and the spirit starts burning. You say, I've never had this happen to me before. This is exciting. And your mind is just filled with things and ideas. Pure intelligence comes into you. You're animated. And uh, you don't only want to speak once. You want to speak a couple of times. You say, this is amazing to me. I don't know myself. Never saw myself act like this, but I'm, this is just glorious. And the mission president will start to stand up and, and the, the missioner will say, no, please, please, president. So he'll sit down again. And he'll go on and on, and some of those will go five, six, seven hours. And gradually our young elders learn how to cultivate the spirit so that you, you don't have a casting of pearls, you have a receiving of pearls, and you're th grateful for it. President uh, Joseph Smith, at the time of the dedication of the Kirtland Temple, was told by the Lord that he and the First Presidency, who had been in fasting and prayer and had crossed the veil, could also take all the other quorums across. So they called in the Quorum of the Twelve, 
They called in the high priest quorum, they called in the 70s quorum, and they called them all in, and um, they all crossed the veil except one quorum. That was the elders' quorum. They didn't make it. And because they were immature about the way they did it, they didn't think they had to cultivate the spirit, they just all sat back, you know, oh, uh, what's the Lord going to do it anyway? He didn't. He never did. So when they got home and heard what a marvelous experience the others, they'd all crossed the veil, they'd been in the spirit world, they'd actually talked with members of the priesthood beyond the veil, they'd been told wonderful things in the history of the church, and they were so envious, too, I wish I could have had that, I don't know why the Lord didn't give it to me. You have to learn how to cultivate the spirit and because it's sensitive and it's offended easily if, if we're half awake and indifferent, it, it won't respond. Now then, um, the Lord says, I'm so anxious to give you things if you'll just ask. Please ask, because I want to give it to you. Now we, I'm going to talk a minute about, the, in a minute, about the, the quorum of the twelve among the Jews. Jesus said, other sheep I have that are not of this fold. And they watched their eyes, and they said, that's good, good, got other sheep. Father, they're not asking. Then don't tell them. But I want to tell them. Don't tell them. If they're not curious enough to ask, I have no desire to share it with them. Don't tell them. So the Savior was not allowed to tell them. Well, some of the finest breakthroughs we have in the books that I've been preparing for you have been the result of my being absolutely frustrated. And I've said, Heavenly Father, if this isn't a mystery that's to be held back, Help me understand what this is really all about because this just doesn't make sense to me. I don't understand this at all. And so I'll be going along, maybe it'll be three weeks later, and all of a sudden a passage will practically burn its a place in the page for me. And a wonderful spirit comes and I look at it and all of a sudden the spirit says, now there's your answer. That's what I was talking about. Now can you put that together? And I've learned another lesson. Immediately write it down. Because I didn't do that on section 88 verse 26 and 27 and 28 and I couldn't find it again for for uh, seven years because when the spirit whispers to you it will tell you so vividly what a certain thing means that in my own mind I thought it was written that way and I went back and tried to find it written that way and it isn't written that way and if you don't have the Spirit, you won't know that that's what that passage means. And yet if I explained it to you as the Spirit gave it to me, you'd immediately say, well, sure, I can see that that's what, what it would mean. And yet if you don't have the Spirit with you or a teacher to teach it to you, you'll miss it. So I went back and frantically hunted for it. Then decided maybe I was in the wrong book. I thought I read it in the 88th section. It isn't there anymore. So I started looking in the 76. It wasn't there. 84. I looked there. 29. No, 45. Seven years later, the Spirit was kind enough to give it to me again. And I'll tell you, I wrote it down that time. And uh, it's in the first 2,000 years, one whole chapter on it. It's a thrilling insight that the Lord's given us. Now, that comes from asking and praying. And he doesn't give it to you right away. Very seldom will he give it to you right away. But it's sort of put up there in the bank. And when you're in the right place, the Spirit will whisper to you, all right, there's your answer. There it is, beautiful, bright. So gradually line, get line upon line, precept upon precept. That's where you learn the gospel. You want to know how Brother Andrus or President Lee, some of these brethren, they'll take passages of scripture you've read a hundred times maybe. All of a sudden they have a brand new beautiful meaning to it. Nobody ever caught before. That's how they get it. So that's how you can get it. All right, then he says, beware of false prophets and false teachers. I had a couple of my favorite cousins apostatize a few years ago. They joined one of the fundamentalist groups and so forth. When you'd go into their homes, you never saw such benign, sweetness, courtesy, consideration, loving spirit. I thought to myself, now that's fantastic. They've left the church, and they seem like nicer people than they were when they were members. And they were nice people then, but... My, they have such an overflowing manifestation of, of this brotherly spirit. And then I found out it was an act. 
just for my benefit. And when I was not there, they cursed each other and uh, couldn't hold down jobs, had a terrible time, just terrible. It just broke, broke my heart when I saw really what the fruits of their apostasy brought them, from which they have never recovered. So that's what the Lord says. You won't find figs growing on thistles. And if it, is, if it looks like a fig, you pick it and it'll be bitter. And that's what theirs was. They had the pretenses of great Christian love and affection and uh, ministering the Holy Ghost uh, continually upon them. And then I found out that they were, it was ugly. It was terrible. So you can judge them by, as the Lord says, by their fruits. If you're sure that you're seeing the fruits. Now he said, I, I want to assure you that not everybody that's going to church and saying, Lord, Lord, is going to go to, the, to heaven. Always it's he that doeth the will of my Father. It's he whose house is built upon the rock. And you can go to meeting if you're not going on your mission, if you're not doing your home teaching, having your family prayers, trying to serve your neighbors and uh, be righteous, be morally clean. If you're not living according to my revealed pattern for happy living, then your house is on sand. I don't care how much you teach or preach. All right, that takes us over to chapter 15 where he turned to the twelve and said, Ye are my disciples, and you're the light of this people. And he said, Now, I wasn't allowed to tell the ten tribes about you, or, or excuse me, tell the Jews about you or the ten tribes, uh, because they wouldn't ask. It was because of unbelief in them that they didn't ask. And so he said, They thought I was going to preach to the Gentiles. I will never appear to the Gentiles, only my disciples. All right, now he said, I want to tell you something. I'm not sure that they will ask in the future, but if they don't and they never learn about you, would you write down in your record that that's what I meant by other sheep? Now let me ask you a question. Did the apostles ever ask? Did the Jews ever ask? See, I could ask that question. I'll bet I could ask that in a general conference of the priesthood. In Salt Lake City, and I would be amazed if I got more than two or three hands that knew that the, the Jewish apostles finally got around to asking. Now that's how illiterate we are in our, um, in our gospel. I wouldn't expect you to know. But I would expect any member of my own generation to know that ultimately the Jewish apostles did ask about the saints in the other parts of the world. Why should they know it? Because it was in a priesthood manual called An Approach to the Book of Mormon that was studied by the entire priesthood. And I would venture to say that you could ask almost any major point or breakthrough in that marvelous manual up to some 10 years ago and you won't find one out of 10,000 members of the priesthood that picked it up and carried it away with them because they were just as lazy as the original Jewish apostles and weren't curious enough to ask. Now, it's important to be alert about the gospel, to be enthused about the gospel, to be asking your Heavenly Father about the gospel, and then you're going to get it. All right, let me just share this with you now. In the approach to the Book of Mormon by Hugh Nibley, on page 285, and be sure and write this down because you're going to quote it and not know where to get it from. 285 in the original edition, 271 in the 1964 edition. 285 and 271. He discovered, I discovered it myself and thought I was, could, would be able to write a nice article for the era or the ensign and spread the good news that the apostles did know about the Nephites. And lo and behold, Brother Nibley had discovered it four or five years before I did. And it's in his book. Uh, I will be quitting, putting it in the 4,000 years, but I want you now to hear it. Clement of Alexandria, who was taught by the apostles, we think John the Beloved, but anyway, he was taught by the apostles said that the apostles knew about the saints that were on the other side of the earth. Now, have you all got down the reference? 
Did you all write it down? Page 285 and 271, depending upon the edition. Yes. Approach to the, an approach to the Book of Mormon. An approach to the Book of Mormon. It's in the library. One of my 9 o'clock students uh, came over and pointed out that in the 64 edition, it's page 271. But there are two copies in the library. It was a great manual and not appreciated, uh, unfortunately, and seldom referred to, and it's loaded with breakthroughs, as, as, is, it, as is his book Since Camorra. This is why our Heavenly Father gets unhappy with us sometimes. Now listen to it. Clement, the disciple of the apostles, recalls those whom the Greeks designate as the Antichthonians, or those who live on the other side of the world. Even the Greeks knew it. But there were people living on the other side of the world. Which cannot be reached by anyone from our regions, and from which none of the inhabitants dwelling there is able to get to us. And he calls these areas worlds. And he says, now this is quoting Clement, who was close to the apostles, the ocean is not to be crossed by men. But those worlds which lie on the other side of it are governed by the same ordinances of a guiding and directing God as these which we have. And there it is. And that, as far as I know, is the only recorded reference that gives us uh, documentary proof that the apostles finally found out that there were Israelites on the other side of the earth and they were under the same ordinances and principles of the gospel as the Jews were on that side. Right? It's in the writings of uh, Origen, O-R-I-G-E-N. And he gives you the original quote. That's where I found it. Um, it's in the, um, they call it the post-apostolic um, fathers. I have about uh, 16 volumes of them. And I was going through there one day, and I ran across this. I couldn't believe my eyes. I said, then they did finally ask. Clement, who was taught by the apostles, says they did know that there were people on the other side of the earth that were under the gospel discipline. Well, and I was so excited. You know, when you find the nuggets, it's like discovering a new land. And I was getting ready to eventually prepare it in some kind of form. And it was... Uh, it got delayed, etc., and I finally was sitting in priesthood meeting, and lo and behold, here Brother Nibley has it in his book. And so, there it was. Uh, is there any reason why you couldn't prepare an article for the uh, Ensign, uh, even though uh, Hugh Nibley had published it in his book? Oh, no, no. Because that way the church would find out about it. I doubt if they're ever going to read Hugh Nibley's book. Well, they, the whole priesthood read it, you see, but they didn't pay any attention to it. They weren't asking questions. They couldn't hear the answers. They didn't know that much about the Book of Mormon. This is why the Lord says we're under condemnation. He said there's a lot of things we don't believe in that are true, that he's taught in the Book of Mormon. And he says as a result, the church is under a curse. And we're still under it. Yes, uh, they would have asked him later. Probably... Uh, they got to reading over, maybe John the Beloved or one of them got to reading it and said, other sheep, I wonder what he really meant by that. And asked the Lord and the Lord told him. Spread it among the apostles, taught it to Clement. Clement recorded it. There are Israelites on the other side of the world that Christ visited. They're under the gospel. Good news, you see. And, and even the Greeks knew that there were people that had gone on the other side of the world called them Adichthonians. The, the, repeat which? Oh, okay, this is, this is the part that Clement says. He says, The ocean is not to be crossed by men, but those worlds which lie on the other side are governed by the same ordinances of a guiding and directing God as these on this side. Did you get it? Okay. The text that this is taken from, is it widely accepted among other churches? Oh, yes. Yeah, these, these are writings by men who lived uh, the century after the apostles. Why would Christ, if this is true, why would he say the things that he did to the Nephites? Uh, it seems to me like uh, it would have been a misrepresentation to them to lead them to believe that he had left the whole world in complete ignorance of their existence. He did. He did leave them in complete ignorance. It was later that they asked. They hadn't asked up to that time, and that's why he says, and if they do not ask 
It's so important that you record what I'm now going to say so that your descendants and the Gentiles in the latter days will know what I meant when I said other sheep I have. But now we know that they did ask and they were told. But it's only recorded by Clement. That's the only thing that any of our scholars have found. Christ explains to the Nephites that they didn't ask uh, when he's here in the New World, which is after the Ascension, right. quite, a way, quite a bit after the Ascension, right. which is after he told whatever apostle it was that uh, sought him out in private. No, no, it would have been after that that the apostle sought him out in prayer, probably John the Beloved or somebody. It might have been 50 years afterward. But it was after this event. In other words, he had to have a direct revelation on it. No, it was after his ascension that it would have happened. But I thought that little nugget was worth sharing with you. And, and I hope that someday you'll sit in priesthood meeting or Relief Society and share that with people. Will you tell them? Uh, of course, they may not know about this passage in 3 Nephi, so few people read the Book of Mormon. But uh, it's kind of exciting that he said, now, they didn't ever ask me about you. And in case they don't in the future, I want you to record that it was you I was talking about, plus the ten tribes. So you share that with, with people. Let them know that good news. Uh, yes? Is this considered Mormon doctrine? A Mormon doctrine. It was taught in a priesthood manual. Is that what you mean? Yeah, we see, we, when you say, is this Mormon doctrine, um, we, have to, we have to be a little careful on that because the church <clears throat> has, um, has a code of, of things that we have accepted as the plan of salvation that we voted on. And that's our basic doctrine, isn't it? then to understand a lot of that doctrine and implement it, we have lots of teachings that we've never voted on. Church had never voted on this, if that's what you meant. But it's a, it's, it was accepted in a priesthood manual as a teaching. Okay? Right. Okay, now the, the Savior says now, there's going to be a great gathering of Israel in the last days, and those Gentiles are willing to believe will be blessed and, and be received as Israelites. But he said, woe unto the unbelieving Gentiles. Because they're going to scatter the Indians, they're going to persecute them, and they're going to abuse them. And then he said, if they reject my gospel, and I have to take it out from among them, they will receive revolution, fire, destruction, and my people who are the remnants of Israel will go through them like a lion tearing them to pieces. Now he said, that doesn't have to happen. That's 21st chapter. This doesn't have to happen. But it will happen if the Gentiles reject my gospel. Now, this is where we are in the United States today. And we're, we're, we're find, we find some of our own brethren, some of our own scholars, lined up on the wrong side, saying there are no secret combinations, uh, that um, the Book of Mormon oversimplifies it, so to speak, uh, that we have never have been such a great people, and so forth, and, all is well in Zion, etc. You'll hear that, boy, every so often. 